We're not supposed to consume this much news. We're all consuming it all around the clock. Yeah. And so all these little discrete moments throughout the day, it's too much. It's too much. I, I have friends who are having like mental breakdowns. So you can't unsee some of these things after a while. And it's, it's like debilitating in a way. It's, it's so, re-traumatizing. We're re-traumatizing. And so the news, okay, you've been informed, you know, but we're all addicted to our phones right now. So when do we reach the point where it's too much? Um, how do we um, use that information for something, I don't know, proactive or something like that, you know? So uh, I'm here with Janine Zakaria. It's uh, great to have you here. We're, we're shooting this live from the Z3 conference 2023. It's been an emotional day so far. We had a, a little bit of a longer opening plenary than we anticipated, but we had, we heard from uh, Rabbi Shai Held, we heard from uh, Yuri Tamir, Yakim Rubinstein. Um, you moderated a panel there. We had families of hostages. and. What I'm hoping to achieve in this conversation, just to hear a little bit about uh, your reactions to the day and mm -hmm. this moment for the community, and then we can maybe zoom out and talk about the state of the world. And from your perspective, as someone who's you know, a mm -hmm. seasoned journalist and who, who teaches it now, and, and, and kind of your perspective on, on kind of things. So that's kind of just in terms mm -hmm. of the setting, um, because what we try to do with this podcast is take what we do in the conference mm -hmm. and then spread it out throughout the year in other platforms. So thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. It's a real honor to have this opportunity and to sit down with you. And, um, Let's take it away. We start with, you know, as you did in the panel, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, um, I had this whole intro that I had to cut because we were, because we, we, you tried to cram, there's a lot crammed in there, a lot of important stuff. And I, I was going to say that, you know, on the Shabbat evening before it happened, I was at a um, dinner, my friend Dana, and she was telling me about her daughter who's in Young Judea in Israel and how great it was going. I went home, I went to bed, and I couldn't sleep. I checked my phone at 4 a.m., and my friend Will said, are you watching what's happening? And pretty much from that moment over the last, you know, the time we're recording this, 29 days, I haven't stopped working. And um, it's hard to sort of let yourself have those moments to process um, the grief and the shock of it all. And the way that I handle these kinds of things historically is to just work. So, and that means doing journalism and um, sort of, even though I was last based in Jerusalem in 2011, um, most of my career was focused on this. And so people still identify me as the person on this, which is why, you know, I believe you invited me here and, you know, I get asked to do a lot of commentary, moderating, speaking. So I find my role being now more uh, an explainer, an interpreter, for people who don't always have a lot of knowledge on this topic and at a moment of heightened fury. I don't know what else to call it. And so I'm dealing, it's like basically all my worlds combined. I have my um, reporter life. I have my journalism teacher life, my Stanford life now where the issues on the campuses are playing out, um, my media person life. And so it's been a, a really, really tough time but certainly not as tough as it has been for the people who have lost people through this. Yeah, yeah. That, that really, um, that resonates, that, that piece of like just diving into work. Yes. To like block out um, the emotional. It's but total coping, me coping yeah. mechanism. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I felt the same way until last night when, when, the, when the conference started. I'm like, oh, I started feeling, you know, yes. I started seeping in. And I'm, and I'm curious, like, were there moments, were you able to like start feeling or you're just waiting for it to come crashing later? I. I had one like real visceral breakdown um, a few days ago, and I it was weird. I went to do yoga because I'm trying to do a little bit of self care through all this, yeah. and I cried through the whole yoga, yeah. you know, an hour fifteen minute class, and it was, you know, I don't know. I felt better after in a way, more not better, but more able to cope with it all. It's just a, it feels like a lot of pressure to. Uh, I mean, usually, I mean, I, I don't get nervous in situations. I don't get nervous when I go on TV. I don't get nervous when I go on radio. I don't get nervous moderating. Like, I, I'm just sort of what I do. But trying also to guide, you know, top people at Stanford or whatever, how to deal with these things right now. People are so stressed right now. And it's so fraught in a new way. So that's a bit challenging. But, yeah, I think, um, like with anything, with a little bit of time, you know, you, you start to process it in different ways. So that's, that's sort of what I'm doing now. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm always curious with, with people who, who, I mean, this is my understanding, mm -hmm. so, so please correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, but, but obviously you have a very deep personal connection to yeah. the subject matter, but you're also, your profession yes. requires you to kind of step back, and I'm just curious, in this moment, 
um, what helps you do that, and if you're able, because you're, you're, you know, you're also facing media, the media outside, mm -hmm. but also students on campus, as you said, yeah. right? And so there's, there seems, I'd imagine for that, if I was in, in your shoes, it, mm -hmm. it would be difficult to kind of um, decouple those things and just, you know. Yeah, and it's not, a, it's not really a decoupling. It's like I basically I put my knowledge and background to work. So I speak fluent Hebrew. I lived in Israel um, from when I was a student in 94, uh, January 94, three or four months after the side of the Oslo Accords, right? On and off until 2011. And so I, I was there, you know, a long time. And so I think, you know, understanding um, Israeli society, understanding the conflict, I've been to Gaza many times, I've traveled throughout the Arab world. Um, it's my duty to kind of like use that knowledge to, ex all I do is try to explain. I'm not a, an, an advocate for anything. I just sort of say, well, you know, here's what it is. And so I can do that. And so, you know, part of what I was doing in the first days after October 7th was I was just glued to, like many people, Israeli Channel 12, Israeli Channel 13, you know, the new TV stations or whatever, listening to Galit Saha, listening to Koli Sorel, like trying to, monitor, which is what I was trained to do in the early 90s when I worked at Reuters, because you have all the top officials going on and talking, and you had people at that time who were calling in, even from their homes, they were still under attack, so you really had a, a, a vision of what was happening. And then I could take that and explain that to American audiences. Um, and so I don't, I, don't, I don't feel pressure in that regard. I mean, my role uh, at Stanford as an educator is to teach nuts and bolts, reporting and writing, and how to do good journalism. Mm -hmm. And so that's no different whether I'm teaching about reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or reporting on San Carlos, California. It's pretty much the same skills. What's different now, I guess, is, um, you know, I had one Jewish student who came and cried in my office that she didn't feel safe. And I had another Jewish student who is um, at the sit-in for the Palestine, Free Palestine protests. Yeah. And so and then they're both, and I, you know, I'm talking, th talking it through with them, the way I talk it through with any students who want to, who are open to listening. And um, I've also, along the way, I've had to give some tough love to administrators who are struggling with this, like about what's really different now. And what's really different now is that the starting point of these protests, um, I'm sorry, I'm like sort of shifted into the campus no, no, yeah. part of this, but from this sort of like 1948 prism, that it's not only about the occupation, it's about the very existence of Israel that is being protested or challenged. And I, I think a lot of people in power are like a step behind on that. They're not really grasping that. So I'm trying to help explain some of that. Yeah, so I was gonna ask, so you, so yeah. you, uh, you, you saw where I was going with this, so what's different this time? Because yes. you've seen it for so long, yes. you've seen it progress, and you know, I too was, you know, uh, during those years, also on the ground, you know, as a soldier, you know, in Gaza, you know, and during the disengagement mm -hmm. before that, et cetera. But, but uh, you know, something does feel different. Oh, know, yeah. Totally different. And it's, um, I think, you know, in the 90s, and I referenced this a bit during the Z3 conference panel, um, you know, I lived in Jerusalem and, you know, you could hear pretty regular, with certain regularity in those years, like Bus 18 blowing up or Cafe Moment. Uh, blown up, Sparrow blown up, and there were no that I recall this kind of feverish protests calling those kinds of acts of terrorism um, legitimate resistance. You didn't have that, and um, whereas you you always did have you know Israel as victim, okay they've been attacked, and then Israel's retaliation, then Israel as persecutor, and that that these these dueling victimhood narratives that you navigate as a journalist. Um, but that's what's so different. And I, you know, walking around campus and the first time seeing on the concrete, you know, from the river to the sea and knowing what that means was a little bit, you know, it was, it was striking. And I know, I know what's happening. I know in academia the idea of Israel as the settler colonial apartheid state, but it always felt more of a um, fringe uh, not a fringe, but a minority view. And so what I'm trying to figure out right now as a journalist is, is this truly uh, a widespread view on the campus, campuses right now, or is it just the loudest? Mm. And I think we have to wonder also, are we oversampling 
So a colleague of mine who's at GW, Israeli professor, wrote to me and he said, you know, when they put up the, they screened the, what did it say, the, the, the glory to the martyrs yeah, yeah, on the yeah. buildings yes. of the Holocaust survivor, yeah. the funded. Yeah, my friend's there, the Hillel rabbi there. Yeah, right. So it's a whole balagan there. And um, he said, you know, is this three kids with a laptop yeah. or is this, or, or do I have to like protect my kids? Mm. You know, like, and so there's so much confusion around that. And I think the only way to deal with it probably is to have some kind of education, some kind of learning on the campuses about all this. But I don't think this is the moment. I think it's very hard to do any kind of like sulha, like peace. There's no peace things. You can maybe give information to people because people don't have information that's good necessarily, or they're very, it's too activist oriented right now. It's so too you, slogany. When you mean sulcha, you mean between like the groups on campus? Yeah, we're not gonna get like, you know, people who are in the free Palestine with the kids from Hillel right now, yeah. we're all gonna do a sulcha. There's yeah. no, uh, translate, I mean like there's no, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, like it's, a peace summit, a peace. Yeah, it's uh, like when we were kids, you know, I'd fight with my, with my siblings, my dad would be like, go to the room, figure right. it out and come back when you're, you There's know, no like, shalom bite right yeah, now. There's no yeah. like a peace in the house. Right now it's like, things are very, maybe, once the Israeli military offensive in Gaza ends at some point, then maybe. But I think at the moment, it's very hard to have any of that kind of mutual understanding. I think that should be the goal. Yeah. I think the goals right now is like, are people supported, protected, safe? Very basic. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we pushed down the Maslovian, you know, pyramid a little bit. We're, we're not in the, you know, self-actualization, having these conversations. Yeah. Right now, we need, like, security and just yes. being safe. Yes, very basic. Yeah, yeah, very, very basic. I mean, it's unfortunate for you know, in academia or, or even in our conference, we try to have these conversations, these complex conversations. It feels like in these moments, like people want to throw nuance out the window. Oh God, you know, and I said something on TV and you know, they asked me about the campuses. I wasn't expecting it. And I basically just said, you know, the Jewish kids don't feel safe. Yeah. They got administrators got to make them feel safe. You know, and that I was heartbroken by what's happening on the campuses. And, you know, and then just the other day at Stanford, we had a Muslim student who was, who was run over in a hit and run. So we can't deny that, oh. you know, the Muslim students don't feel safe. So, uh, you know, there's got to be, like you said, right now, safety. Yeah. Um, and then maybe we can do more education, yeah. sulha, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so we talked yeah. about campus. We talked about what's going on there. Yes. I'm curious also to hear about how things are shifting in media. I mean, I, I have very, very, extremely limited experience, but I remember I took... Um, I did like five minutes in the direction of doing like Hasbara work, yeah. you know, and then I'm like, this is not for me. But I started in that path and already, and this is like, this is 2011. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, and I remember even, it was back then, you know, the media is biased, et cetera, yes. et cetera. And like, have you seen that get worse, stay the same? Is it shifted? Is it, what are we dealing with? Today? I mean, well, first of all, since 2011, the whole media landscape has shifted, right? right? Sure, so right. it used to be very simple. Um, talks that I'd be asked to speak, uh, you know, Jewish federations or whatever, you know, is the, is the media biased against Israel? Most of the people in the room would think yes, yeah. right? Um, of course, then, you know, just the other day, I got a call from um, a Palestinian writer who's going to start writing a column for Al Jazeera, and he wants to talk about how the media is biased towards Israel, right? And I said to him, have you, are you on the, are now your laptop? Like, go on the New York Times homepage now. You see what you see there? The Palestinian destruction image is on the homepage. Go to the Washington Post. Like, you know, so everybody tends to see bias. Um, and I'm not saying there aren't problems in the media, but people tend to see the bias if it doesn't reflect the way they want the story told. Okay, or that they're, the narrative that they think should be told centered at all times. Right. And so if you're coming at this from a perspective of Israel was attacked, um, this war is justified, that needs to be centered in every story, and you know, that you don't want to see any pictures of destruction in Gaza as a result, then you're going to be disappointed, right? Because there's going to be pictures of destruction in Gaza. Yeah. And likewise, if you're a Palestinian, you're watching like a segment that's all about the Israeli hostages right now, they're going to be like, well, you know, 9,000 Palestinians were killed, so they're going to be upset. So the media's job, in my view, whether it's in this conflict or any other situation, is to inform, interpret, explain to an audience of various levels of knowledge what they need to know, and what is happening, make sense of chaos. And so right now we have a pretty chaotic situation. Yeah. So I think, um, 
you know, I think that the media, the media, which is such a terrible term, let's talk about the mainstream, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the AP, the Reuters, they're doing the best they can. And um, these are all professional journalists, which means, too, that when they make a mistake, they do a correction or a clarification. And a lot of people are focused right now on the New York Times headline um, about the bombing of a hospital. Okay, well... They actually, people should understand, too, and this is not an excuse, but that it's not like I had this conversation with Isabel Kirshner the other day in a, in a webinar. And you know, the people who write headlines are different than the people who write the stories, who are different than the editors, and it's very complex. Yeah. And so there's not, a, there's, not like a, there's not like an anti-Israel or an anti-Palestinian conspiracy. This is like hardworking people trying to tell this story. Now, I think where people get agitated, especially, though, is in the question of the context. And how do you... What do you do after paragraphs one and two? What do paragraphs three and four say, right? And um, are you putting up high enough that Israel suffered this worst massacre ever by a terrorist organization? You know what I mean? Like, are you putting that there, or is it, like, not in the story? Like, that's what people, I think, would have a gripe. One thing I would say to people, though, is if you want to have impact with the media, is to engage in a respectful way with the reporters and the editors. When you see a story, okay, and you say, you know, I'm curious, I'm curious, dear journalist, whoever, um, how you chose your language for this, or why you chose to center on this person, or why you put this context this low down. But do it in a way that's not attacking. I think you have more, more ability to influence things that way. Yeah. You know, um, because if you take a walk in my inbox, from when I covered the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for, you know, daily for 20 years, it's, it's, it can be a frightening place, you know what I mean? And that was before journalists were getting, like, accosted online, really. That was so quaint. I would get emails, yeah. you know? So, I don't know, that's just, you know, sort of a broad overview. I think that they're generally doing a pretty good job. Um, I'm more concerned about the level or not level of, of storytelling that happens on places like TikTok. Yeah. Or Instagram, well, or the dueling, the dueling Hasbara, right? Like, and it's it's um, it's just not it's just not a good way to consume news in general. In these little tidbits, and Kalvachomer, like in this kind of a complexity, like you said, you just sure. cannot get the nuance. For sure, for sure. I think that there's, I mean, there's there's so much to to unpack there. Yeah. Um, I I have one question about the that piece yes or, or more of a comment that i want to go back to like okay so you you told so let's start with the comment first about TikTok yeah. and like these platforms the i think fun like one of the issues of course is the uh monetization right mm-hmm. and what they incentivize in terms of what to get out there yeah so it's not even about truth it's not about conversation it's not even about a position it's about the bottom line right yeah. and it's like a real it's it's beyond cheapening of of, of journalism in a way that's so it's, it's so detrimental to our society, and I find that, you know, so I try not to, uh, you know, remove ourselves from that, those platforms um, inter- when it comes to consuming uh, news mm-hmm. of now. Um, and so that's, that's how I'm seeing it. I'm sure there's, you know, a lot to talk about, like mainstream media or, mm-hmm. or, or legacy media and, and new media and mm-hmm. we'll put that because this is a short, short episode. We'll come back for another one for that. But I, mm-hmm. you know, so you, you shared with our audience how to address or how to um, uh, engage with um, journalists, and I think that the the kernel, if I can pull it out there, which is true for all of it, is to deal with everybody as a human, right? Mm-hmm. You see them, and that's true for the journalists and for the anybody on the other side or even mm-hmm. within the community, outside the community, first as a human, see yes. that person in front of you. And I think that's an incredibly, incredibly important point to drive, especially now, mm-hmm. especially, especially now. Um, but I have, a, I have a question about that. So there's how to deal with journalists, and then there's how to read mm-hmm. and how to be a, a, uh, a, a clever uh, consumer mm-hmm. of, of uh, journalism. So I'm curious if there's any like tips yes. for... Well, I think, um, yes, well, you have to read, like, credible fact-based news, first yeah. of all, first yeah. and foremost. And, and so I'm still a big champion of the mainstream media, even though it's much maligned in 2023. Because I know, having worked at the Washington Post, at Bloomberg, at Reuters, at these kinds of places, that there are a set of standards and requirements, and these places issue corrections. You have to, be, you have to get approval for unnamed sources. You're like, there's certain things that I teach at Stanford that, you know, are based in how these places work. So you're not going to get more reliable information than that. I think the other thing is when you, if you're reading something and it, it's, um, it's exercising, and you're like, oh, I can't believe this, you know? It's either too sympathetic to the Palestinians or it's too this or it's too that. or you, you, don't, you have to read news collectively. 
you can't just take a snapshot of one story. Try and take a bigger view, right? And look over time. Like, okay, well, um, the Times, you know, okay, well, they did that, but then, then they did that. There's this really good story about the kibbutz and the, the helpers and da 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 da, you know, or like, you know, my student, Anat Peled, um, graduated from Stanford. She's awesome. She's now, she's crushing it at yeah. the Wall Street Journal. She's awesome. And she, you know, went down and did a recreation of how these people saved people at the kibbutz and um, the one with the mem, um, forgot what it's called. Anyway, one of the kibbutzim yeah. that didn't, didn't get as hard hit as mm. Bay Area and the others. Right. That's a, you, know, you gotta look at that too. Yeah. And so these stories are being done. Um, so I think being smart about it. And, you know, I don't, also I think we have to sometimes, we're not supposed to consume this much news. Yeah. We're all consuming it all around the clock. Yeah. And so all these little discrete moments throughout the day, it's too much. It's too much. I, I have friends who are having like mental breakdowns. And also, the other thing is when you're, you know, there's something, I have one friend who's like protecting herself by just watching like the 6.30 news, old school, you know? Yeah. David Muir, and that's it. And she's like my age, you know? She's not like an old lady, she's like my age, you know? Not that I'm so young, but like, and these little, the problem with the, going back to the social media thing is like, so you can't unsee some of these things after a while. And it's, it's like debilitating in a way. It's, it's so, re-traumatizing. We're re-traumatizing, and so the news, okay, you've been informed, you know, but we're all addicted to our phones right now. So I would, I would counsel, like, we got to, and I am, believe me, I'm the worst offender of this, but, like, how do we have more discreet news-consuming experiences? When do we reach the point where it's too much? Um, how do we um, use that information for something, I don't know, proactive or something like that, you know? Yeah, that, that's really helpful. That's really crucial to stay grounded, not to be connected too much. Yeah. You know, I think that's... Uh, I'm thankful I have Shabbat for that because yes, I know Shabbat's I'm the critical. worst. I'm the worst, the worst, uh, probably yes. worse offender than you. But I, yeah, you know, scrolling like, through the scroll, night, yeah, the horror yeah, videos, yeah, this, yeah, that. Yeah. I try not to watch those. That's really too, yeah. too much. It's also kind of like that's part of like the traumatizing, re-traumatizing, and that's the spread of the terror in that sense. And I kind of I want to really, you know, in, in my undergrad, you know, Boaz Ganol, he, this is like I think he yes. said like this is the big problem that the media is doing that they show these videos. Yes, that's on a loop. Yeah, on a loop, and that's what that's that's part of the terror. Right? There's, the, yes. there's the attack itself, and then there's the, the secondary psychological warfare. And so I took that to heart, and I'm like, I don't, I, 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 my imagination runs free enough. Yes. You know? Um, so, so look, we, I don't... Wait, well, can I just say one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. Read beyond the headline. Yes. Especially if you're consuming on your phone. Sometimes you'll read a headline, you'll be like, yeah. oh my God, this headline. Yeah. Well, try and read a little longer. Yeah. You know? yeah and, and you talked about also the, the sense of resilience, of like seeing the big picture, not just focusing on one, not yes. the headline, not the one story. Yes. And, and I think that that's, that's, what we, that's what we try to do here. You know, we talked about it a little bit in the opening, mm. but we think, you know, it's a little silly, but like, you know, the JCC has a gym. We go to work out. We go to pick up, you know, heavy, heavy, you know, lift heavy um, weights. And, and that repetition of doing something that's difficult for us makes us stronger. So even you know, reading stories or hearing opinions that you disagree with yes. creates resilience because the world, the world is ugly, unfortunately. unfortunately yes. you know, and if we are able to kind of breathe and see through that, then maybe we will be better for it and, and, mm -hmm. and kind of uplift humanity, which is what I think it's, it's ultimately about. So mm -hmm. thank you for your time. Yes, thanks for short. having we'll me. We'll come back I, for a full-on episode. Amazing what is, you did with Z3. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Janine.